Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will die till the day is done. There is not a friend like the Lord Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He Why would I rejoice when I fall into doubt and temptation? 
because they said because God is working something in you, bringing you through that, developing something in you. How many of you have ever heard of a flu shot? You know what a flu shot is? They give you this shot to help you get the flu. Now how do they, well, how does that shot help you not get influenza or the flu? What does it do? It exposes your body to the flu, but on a small scale. And your body builds up a resistance against that. So when the flu bug comes knocking on your body's door and says, hey, I'm going to knock you down for a couple weeks and just lay you out. And maybe I'll even kill you. Your body says, hey, I already, I already seen your kind before and I ain't fooling with you. You ain't got no place here. I've already developed antibodies to you. I've learned how to resist you. You better go someplace else. You ain't going to get nothing here. I already whooped you before. And I'll whip you again. And because your body developed a resistance. And so it says when you're going through temptation. You know the Bible says God will not allow you to be tempted above that you're able to overcome. And in every temptation he'll make a way for you to escape. God is working in us. There's things we need to develop. Sometimes temptation, the, the Bible says we're tried by fire. Temptation brings out things in us to cause us to be aware of things in ourselves that we didn't know were there. You ever say to yourself after you responded in a wrong way in a situation, whoa, where did that come from? You say to yourself, I can't believe you answering like that or talking like that or responding like that. And it lets us realize there's a weakness in us that needs to be worked on. Praise God. So it says, reach your, it says to joy in tribulation. I'm not hearing too much joy about that. <laughs> and Jesus said, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. He says, Blessed are ye when men first revile you and persecute you. Revile you means when they speak really nasty and mean to you and hateful to you. And say really ugly things to you or about you. And persecute you. He said rejoice. Now is that how we respond? That's how we're supposed to respond. And say oh man or are you going to you foster? For my sake. Rejoice and be seen glad. Why? He says, he gives us the reason. He says, for great is your reward in heaven. There is a great reward laid up for you because you've gone through that. And you endured it. And you didn't give up. And then, he says, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. You know, the Bible says, all they that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Mm. That's true. So if you're going through persecution, that's kind of a statement that you're living godly in Christ Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. And it says all the true prophets, they always got persecuted. People lied about them. People said mean, nasty things to them. People treated them wrong. It's kind of the initiation right to join in the club of those that have that kind of walk with God. So what it's saying is when you get persecuted and people are lying about you for righteousness sake, not because of something we did that was wrong, 
Oh. That's kind of the induction right into that exclusive club of those special people walking with God. So it says rejoice. And we went on and looked at, at that Habakkuk chapter 3, Joel chapter 2, what the Bible says about rejoicing, praising God, giving thanks. It was a wonderful, wonderful time Thursday night. The presence of the Lord was so strong. And uh, it was just a sweet time of being with God's people. And all of you that were able to be here, you know that's true. Yes, sir. And I wish, I wish everybody could have been here. After service, I felt so bad for those that couldn't be here Thursday night. Because I knew what they were missing out on. And what God was wanting to do in our lives. See, this is... This is why we're also studying about this this morning that we started last week. About metaphors and pictures. These are pictures God put in His Word to illustrate the kind of relationship with God He wants us to have. God wants you to walk with Him and know Him. It's not, it's not enough for you to be religious. You can be very religious and go to hell. You can be very religious and be far from God. Yes, sir. Amen. It was religious people that crucified Jesus. Yes, sir. It was false prophets that hated Jeremiah and nearly got him killed. It was religious people worshiping that were sitting in their worship that caused God to send Moses down from the mount to straighten that mess out. Yes, sir. It was very religious people in 1 Corinthians that were so stinking carnal and even in their religion they were really trying to show off Ooh. to show which one was more spiritual but they wouldn't live right. Yes, sir. I've seen that. It seems like the more carnal people are, the more sometimes they want to try to show out and show off. To impress other people. Because the closer we get to the Lord, the less we're concerned about impressing other people, the more we just want to walk with God and know Him and be right with God. And you were created with a purpose in mind. When God breathed life into you and you came into this world, God wanted you to know Him and walk with Him. And in His Word, He gave us these beautiful pictures. Last week, we talked about being filled with the Spirit. The Bible commands us to be filled with the Spirit. Jesus commanded us to be filled with the Spirit. And in Ephesians chapter 4, Paul commanded us to be filled with the Spirit. Don't get drunk with all these other things of the world. Don't get just drunk on all this other junk. Be filled with the Spirit. What are we filled with today? Are we filled with fear? Filled with bitterness towards somebody? Unforgiveness towards somebody? Are we filled with pride? Are we filled with selfishness? Or are we filled with the Spirit of the Lord? Bless the Lord. You know, if I had a big old jar here today, I could fill that up with rocks. And I could still pour some water in there. But it wouldn't hold nearly the amount of water. And you could say it's filled with water if I pour water in it until it runs over. But it's mostly filled with rocks. Yes, sir. And if I want to, the more I want to fill it with water, before I can pour more water in, I've got to take some of those rocks out. And that's the way in our life. All through the scripture in the New Testament, it tells us there's things we need to get out of our life so we can be filled with the presence of God. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. That's why in Ephesians 4, 22 through 24, it tells us to put off the old man, which is corrupt, according to the deceitful lust. 
and be renewed in the spirit of our mind and put on the new man which after Christ is created in righteousness and true holiness. Do you know we can't put on Christ which and that attitude which is Christ-like with righteousness and true holiness if we don't first put off the old man. You can't put the new man on over the old man. You have to take off the old man and then put on the new man. Amen. You can't put on true spirituality over top of carnality. You got to get rid of the carnality. You got to. We got to repent. We got to ask God to forgive us. Turn away from. Repentance means to turn away from sin, turn away from the flesh, turn away from the world, and turn to God with all of our hearts. Amen. Some folks want to live for God, but they they want to stay married to the world, join to the world, and still say they're living for God. Do you know of the seven churches in Revelation? One of them. Pergamos, the name means married to the world. Was it Pergamos or Thyatira? One of those two means married to the world. So here's a church that's married to the world. The church is not supposed to be married to the world. The church is supposed to be the bride of Christ. Yes, sir. All right. Amen. Amen. I'm thankful my wife was just married to me. <laughs> I wouldn't want her to say she loves me and is, quote, married to me, but then I find out she's also been married to some other guy and is still married to him. <laughs> hey Amen. I heard a, not too long ago a situation. A lady contacted us that we love so much. We love her husband, too. But that rascal, in his ignorance, went and got him a girlfriend. And then he told, he'd tell his wife when she found out, oh, I love you. I don't want to leave you. But I love her too, and I don't want to disappoint her. <laughs> And I told her a bunch of lies, and I don't want her to find out the truth about me. Well, his wife found out the truth about it. <laughs> Thank God that woman was a godly woman, and God spoke some things to her, and she trusted God. And God showed up and straightened that situation out. Amen. 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 No man, no woman wants to be married to someone that's really given their heart to someone else. Well, the Lord doesn't want His bride to be given their heart to the world. He wants the, their whole heart. He wants us to love Him with our whole heart. And in Ephesians, amen, if you turn to Ephesians 4, I know we talked about this last week, but this is one of the things, and we talked about it, about what does it actually mean to be filled with the Spirit. That's talking about the presence of God in our hearts so strong, so strong, that it just fills our mind, it fills, fills our spirit. It's Ephesians 4, 18. And be not drunk with wine where it's excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And then we talked last week. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. I was looking right at it, right at the top of the page that said chapter 5. <laughs> Thank you so much. There have been people, you, you helped me, because there have been people saying, looking at Ephesians 4, 18, and it doesn't say that. Not at all. It talks about having your understanding dark and alienated from God. <laughs> Definitely not the same thing. <laughs> Amen. Be filled with the Spirit. Our very heart, our mind, our, our attitude, our very being needs to be filled with the Spirit. And then the Bible talks about walking in the Spirit. And if you turn to Galatians, and this is 
chapter 5, verse 16 and 17. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 and 17. If someone would stand and read that. Praise God. Ephesians, uh, Galatians 5, 16 and 17. Thank you, Brother Daniel. From this we say that walk in the spirit, and he shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So the key to overcoming temptation and overcoming the flesh is to walk in the spirit. Go ahead, my brother. For the flesh lusted after the spirit, and he gave the spirit, sorry, and the spirit that gave the flesh. Now the word lusted there means to have an overpowering desire. The overpowering desires of the flesh actually work against the Spirit and the work of the Spirit in your life. But this work of the Spirit in your life has an overpowering desire against the exact opposite of the overpowering desires of the flesh. Go ahead, my brother. And these are contrary the ones to the other. They're fighting each other. So that he cannot do the things that he will. You can't just do whatever you want. Incidentally, do you know that the the number one thing in Satan worship and in in witchcraft is do what thou uh, what thou will. Whatever you feel like doing, that's do you know that modern society from the 1960s in America and has gone around the world actually took up the cry that came from witchcraft and Satanism and what the devil really told him is do what you feel like doing. Do whatever you'd like to do. Whatever you want to do, do that. Whatever you feel like doing, do that. That's not what... You can't walk right and live for God that way. The Bible says you can't just do whatever you feel or like doing or what your flesh would like to do. Because what the flesh wants to do will destroy the work of the Spirit in your life. But if you let the Spirit of God work in your life, it's going to destroy the work of the flesh. You're going to have to let go of that stuff. Yes, sir. Every one of us got to make up our mind. Amen. Amen. There's some people live for material things and, and money and material things. But Jesus said, you can't serve two masters. You're going to love one and gradually lose your love for the other and actually even despise the claims of the other one on you. Or else you'll It'll be opposite. You'll love that one and despise the other one. He said, you cannot live for God and for mammon. That mammon is material wealth, money, material wealth. It's the God of this world. Amen. Amen. You can't live for both. You live for God to do the will of God. Or you live for the things of this world, but you cannot live for both. Right. <laughs> and that's important for us to understand. Amen. So when we walk with God, we're going to be walking away from some things the flesh wants us to get involved and let that become the dominant thing in our life. But if we're going to walk God, He has to be the dominant thing in our life. Amen. He has to supersede everything else. The Bible talks to us about living in the Spirit. Turn with me to Acts chapter 17 and verse 28. Paul says, for, this is Acts 17, 28, for in Him we live. Yes, sir. Is that where you live? Is that where you live? Do you live in Him? 
Or do you come visit him sometimes at his house and then go live somewhere else? The Lord said, my people, he said, the ox will not forget its master. The donkey has enough sense to know who feeds it. But my people don't know. They don't even think about it. They don't thank me. They don't praise me. I protect them. I provide for them. I bless them. And they don't even say thanks. They don't even recognize I did that for them. They don't even acknowledge it. And he said, they, my people have forgotten me days without number. That means that you can't even count the number of days they've gone all day long and never even thought about the Lord. Well, that's not living in Him. That's living far from Him. In Him we live. Someone turn to Psalm, well, let's all turn there. Psalm chapter 90, the 90th Psalm, and verse 1. The 90th Psalm. Now, I mentioned last week, what does it mean to do this? To live in the Spirit. To walk in the Spirit. To be filled with the Spirit. Does it mean you walk around weird? Look like you got a belly ache or something? You're walking around glassy eyes, banging into things. Someone says, you feel all right? I'm just walking in the Spirit. I'm just abiding in Him. That's not abiding in Him. Jesus didn't act like that. Moses didn't act like that. Abraham didn't act like that. The first example we have of someone who really walked well, the, the Bible tells us that Enoch walked with God. Then Noah walked with God. And Abraham was a man who walked with God. He was called a friend of God. Praise the Lord. They were not weird. Oh, it's true the world will think if you live for God, they'll sometimes think you're weird. Peter said that in his epistle. He said, the world, your friends that you used to have in the world, they will not understand you. They'll understand why you don't want to go get drunk with them. Why you don't want to do things that are wrong with them anymore. Right. They'll not understand. They'll even talk bad about you about it. I'll never forget one night. Back then I was real, real thin. And I was, it was when I was in Marine Corps, I was in Iwakuni. And I'd come into my cubicle. And we lived in a big squad day, which was a big, huge room about the length of this room and probably about this width and it had like a hallway down the middle and they with wall lockers they had divided it up into little cubicles four guys that live in one cubicle area but you, it was all open actually except for the wall lockers <coughs> and, and the bed but I was in my in my rack in my bed and pulled the cover over me and I was laying in there and I was so skinny I guess they didn't know I was there. But I heard some guys in the next cubicle talking. And there was another guy in our in our unit that claimed to be living for God. He definitely did not believe the same message the apostles preached. He believed you just say you believe and you're okay. But the Bible, you'll not find one preacher in the Bible that told anybody to come to the Lord. Just say you believe and you're okay. The Bible says the devil believes. And he's not okay. Amen. But I heard these guys in the next cubicle talking and said, you know, if I was going to get religion, I'd want to get the kind Ed got, not the kind Lucas has got. Boy, that, I, that was like a knife going into my heart. Mm. That was painful to hear them say that. I thought, what in the world? And the other one said, yeah, me too. said, you know, Ed, you can tell a dirty joke and he'll laugh at it. And he's got a few he knows himself. <laughs> Sit down and watch something with you. Says Lucas, his religion. 
him is too much. It's his whole life. If you tell him a dirty joke, he don't think it's funny. And he don't want to hear it. And he won't go out and have a beer and get drunk with him. Another said, yeah, if I was going to get religion, I'd, I, I, I wouldn't mind having religion, but I wouldn't want it to mess my life up. <laughs> but then when they came in and, and they had trouble, or a family member back home was sick, or they were having problems on their job, I've had them come in at 2 in the morning and wake me up and say, Lucas, would you pray for me? Or would you pray for my mom? My mom's going through a mess right now. Would you pray for my mom and dad? My mom and dad, I'm really concerned about them. And one day, Ed came to me. He wasn't there when this conversation happened. He said, I don't know what it is. You and I are both, we're the only two that claim to be Christians in this unit. I don't know why it is. Whenever they want prayer, they always come and ask you to pray. None of them ever ask me to pray. <laughs> So I felt a little bad. <laughs> None of us want people to say bad things, or we certainly don't want to re represent the Lord in such a way that it causes people to not want to know the Lord. Praise God. Hallelujah. I'm thankful by the grace of God, my eyes are there. Well, could he? That I baptized the first person I ever baptized. I think there were seven events who were baptized while I was there. Something like that. And uh, several received the Holy Ghost. Praise God, Brother Gil Salinas, the first one I ever baptized. He and I left there. And he went to Florida. And I went to California, opposite sides of the United States. Later, God, I was in university and God spoke to me to go to Bible school. I got to Bible school and one day the registrar come in and asked me, he said, do you know a guy named Gil Salinas? And I said, well, yeah. But how do you know him? He said, he said you baptized him in Jesus' name. I said, that's true. He said, the two of you, he said, the two of you were stationed together as Marines over in Japan. I said, yes, that's true. He said, well, he's coming to Bible school this year and he was asking about people that were there. And I mentioned you were here. And he said, oh my, that's the guy that baptized me in Jesus. <laughs> he, came, he came from Florida not knowing I was going to be there. I came from California not knowing he was going to be there. We were in the same Bible school class and graduated together. Amen. And then he, I got to preach for him several times. He pastors a wonderful church in Alabama. Praise God. God's good. Amen. This relationship with God, one terminology the Bible uses for it is being filled with the Spirit, where He just fills your being, your mind, your heart, your very spirit is filled with the presence of God. And then He uses this metaphor of walking with the Lord. Walking with the Lord. That's talking about during your daily life. He is with you and you recognize He's with you all the time. Amen. And then this phrase, living in the Spirit. Psalm 90, verse 1. Lord, Thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. You're our home address. In you we live. Paul said in, in, in Acts 17, 28, in Him we live and move and have our being. We don't move outside of Him. We don't have our being or our existence outside of Him. Our existence is always, the home address of our very existence is in the Lord. Amen. He is our dwelling place. He's where we live. He's our home address. We don't come to his house and visit him and then leave him here. That's what heathen do. They go to their temple and acknowledge their God and go back home and their God stays in the temple. It's not that way with the true God. 
When you come, he comes with you. When you go home, he goes with you. When you go to the job, he's with you. When you come home at night, he's with you. When you leave in the morning, he goes with you. Amen. You walk with him. You live in his presence. Amen. Psalm 91 is just in his, I used to, I, I learned this, I memorized it. <coughs> but then there were things about it I couldn't understand. Because this is such a marvelous promise, but I saw fellow Christians and even in my own life sometimes promises in this weren't happening in my life. And I couldn't understand why. Hmm. And then I realized he tells who these promises belong to. They don't belong to everybody who calls himself a Christian. They don't belong to every religious person. These promises only belong to a certain group of people. And you and I want to be one of those people. We really do. Would someone stand and read in Psalm 91... It has 16 verses. Why don't someone read the first five verses if you don't mind? And then someone else the next five, and then someone else the last six. <coughs> okay, now who are we talking about here? Who is the individual? He that dwelt, he lived in the secret place of the Most High. Sit down just a moment, Sister Victoria, if you would, because I want to I want to jump over to Psalm. Keep your finger here, but jump over very quickly to Psalm 15 and Psalm 24. You're going to see that if you're going to dwell in the secret place of the Most High, there are some things that are going to be required of you. Yes, sir. Amen. Amen. Praise God. In, in Psalm 24, it says, verse 3, Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in His holy place? This is talking about someone coming into God's presence, coming into God's actual presence dwelling place. Who's going to ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who's going to stand in His holy place? They're going to get in the Spirit. He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity nor sworn deceitfully. Well, Brother Lucas, my hands are not clean. Well, you can repent and He'll forgive you. Well, my heart not what it ought to be. Well, you can repent and He'll forgive you. He'll, he'll cleanse your hands. He'll forgive your sin. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm so thankful for that. If your hands are not clean, if your heart's not pure, you don't have to stay that way. Friend, you can walk out of here today with clean hands and a pure heart. I don't care what you've done. You can walk out of here in the presence of God with clean hands and a pure heart. That's what the gospel's all because he cares about you. He wants you to be able to be cleansed. And your heart and spirit and mind heal. Now you see that. He did, that's the person going to enter the presence of the Lord. Now go over to Psalm 15 and look at this. Because this is different. There were four things required of the person who's going to come into the presence of God. Clean hands, a pure heart. I thought lifted up his soul unto vanity. That means you're not living your life for stuff that don't matter. For empty stuff. I heard the story, Sister Mangan told it, of a lady that was in their church. She wanted a big, magnificent mansion of a home. She wanted to live in a home that was like a palace where her husband, he had a good job, but he didn't make that kind of money. Mm -hmm. So she, she dressed her family in cheap clothes 
that came from thrift stores. Now I've bought plenty of clothes from thrift stores. And I've bought good clothes from thrift stores. I'm certainly not against that. And one of my favorite places in Japan to go is Pardon. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. I'm not against that. But this woman wouldn't buy her family new clothes or things like that. And she would not fix good meals for them. Morning, noon, and night. Because beans and cornbread were real inexpensive. That's what she fixed for them day after day after day. Saving all that money to buy herself this big magnificent house. And she saved and saved. And the day came she bought the house. But she had pretty much lost her family in the process. She had a big house and her all her wonderful furniture. As a fairly young woman, she got cancer and was dying. Oh. Yeah. And Sister Mangan said as she lay there on that hospital bed in the last days before she died, Tears were flowing from her eyes almost all the time. And she said, cornbread and over and over and over. She'd say, cornbread and beans. Cornbread and beans. I tortured my family with cornbread and beans so I could have my house. I fed them only cornbread and beans. My boys never knew a good cake. They never got a nice pie. My kids, my husband, I fed them just cornbread and beans, cornbread and beans. I got my house, but all they got was cornbread and beans. Well, I like cornbread and beans, but nobody likes something like that for three meals a day, seven days a week. <laughs> I visited the mansion called the Breakers that the Vanderbilt family built up in Rhode Island. Mm. It, is a, it is a mansion that is so magnificent. Mm. It would absolutely rival the palace of Versailles that was built by Louis XIV. It is one of the most lavish, elaborate places ever built on earth. But then I heard the story of, it seemed like the curse or judgment of God that was against that family. Of sicknesses, of birth deformities and defects, and one thing after another, and one after another in the family, there was always somebody in that family. Many died very young. That, family, that house was not a place of joy. It was magnificent. It was beautiful. It was far grander than most palaces of kings. But it was a place of sorrow and weeping. And the family still owned it. And for many years, the woman, the last living relative, who was not married, lived in three rooms. That palace, I, I don't remember, that huge house, it was, I can't remember how many rooms, they had like 114 rooms or something like that. Each of them huge. Each of them magnificent. Most all of it was just closed off. Heat not even turned on. Lights not even turned on. Just laying there in the dust until the family, finally a society said, well, it's so pretty, the public ought to get to see it. And so the family said, well, we only live in, the woman said, I only live in three rooms. The public can come and see the rest of it. And so the rest of it was turned into museums. You can get the things of this world, friend, but I'm going to tell you, they can turn out to be deadly and filled with sorrow and sickness and grief.
free. But if you walk with God, oh, friend, that's where life really is. Notice Amen. this Psalm 15 with me. Who shall abide? Now, abide doesn't mean visit or get into. It means to live there. Who shall abide in his tabernacle and shall dwell in thy holy hill? Not who shall ascend into his holy hill or dwell. Takes four things to get into his holy hill. Clean hands, a pure heart. You don't live your life for stuff that don't matter. You don't live for vanity. And you, you're honest. You don't swear deceitfully. You don't lie. If you've done any of those things that's wrong, then you repent. Get right and do right. Then you can enter in and come into the presence of God. But notice, four things to get into His presence, but eleven to live there. Ooh. Who shall abide in his tab thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that walketh uprightly. you got to walk right. And worketh righteousness. you got to do right. And speaketh the truth in his heart. you got to talk right. He that backbiteth not with his tongue. You don't talk bad about people behind their back. Nor doeth evil to his neighbor. You don't mistreat your neighbor. And do your neighbor wrong. Nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor. You don't run around as a gossip. Telling every juicy little tidbit of ugly stuff you hear about somebody. In whose eyes a vile person is condemned. If something's wrong, I don't care how popular the person is doing that. I don't care how much money they got or how much you like them or how nice they are. If it's wrong, it's wrong. In whose eyes a vile person is condemned, but he honoreth them that fear the Lord. The person that really has a respect for God and trying to live for God, you respect them for that. Amen. Amen. He swears to his own hurt and changeth not. He makes a promise, he keeps it. Even if it turns out to be difficult for him or her. He put it not out his money to usury, nor take his reward against the innocent. He doesn't rip people off with ridiculously high interest rates on money he loans. He's not a loan shop. He doesn't take a reward against the innocent. If he's in a position of authority, he doesn't take bribes and mis pervert judgment or mistreat someone because somebody slipped him a bribe. Because he that doeth these things shall never be made. You walk like that, it's a solid way to live. All right, let's go back to Psalm 91 now. Go ahead. Notice, this is the person that dwells in the secret place of the Lord. They abide. They stay there under the shadow of the Almighty. They don't just come into His presence and then go out from under His shadow and just live their own life doing their own thing. They abide. They stay under His shadow. We used to talk about living so that you're covered with the blood of Christ all the time. Amen. Amen. Go ahead. Uh, start verse 2 again. For you. You see the picture the Lord has given us here. missionary brother in Liberia. I've always loved him and his wife. They are godly people. They love God. They went to a poor country, a difficult situation, and they have worked in very difficult circumstances and loved God. When Ebola hit, the area where they were at was the worst area for Ebola. Many people 
told him, David, you need to go. You need to protect yourself. You need to get out of here. Hundreds of people. Liberia was hit the worst and hundreds of people. They even had some people from their church, some family from their church that died. There were people among the church people, some of them died. People all around them, neighbors, they began to, they contacted Compassion Services and Compassion Services sent money and they went and bought rice for the people that had Ebola, they would take them into a farm town area and nobody would bring them food. There was nothing. They were left there to die or if the fever broke and they overcame it, then they could leave. But most of them, when they got there, they never left because they would either starve to death or die. Nobody would bring them food. Nobody was bringing them things. And no, they were so sick anyway. I, I, but anyway, horrible fevers and all the different things that go with Ebola. Brother Stewart got money from Compassion Services and began to get buy rice and take rice and vegetables and other things to the Ebola compound using his Chiefs for Christ vehicle to go to the Ebola compound, going and praying for people that had Ebola, going all over the area, praying for people that had Ebola. Man, are you crazy? Don't you know you might get Ebola? Don't you think you better run off to America? No. Brother Stewart's attitude is, these are my people. These are the people God sent me to minister to. You think I'm leaving when they're going through this struggle? I'm going to be right here with them all through the middle of it. He stayed right through the middle of it, praying for people, taking food to people. People wept when he brought them rice and brought them vegetables and said, we have no food, we have no hope, we haven't eaten for days. You saved our lives. God began to heal many people that he prayed for that had Ebola were healed after he prayed for them. They are having victory and having revival in the heart of the area worst hit by Ebola anywhere on earth. They're having revival and Holy Ghost outpouring in the middle of it because he loves those people, loves God and trusts God more than he worries about Ebola. What a man of God. How can you do that? I'm going to tell you because brother and sister Stewart have a walk with God that is absolutely amazing. This isn't their first battle. When the civil war was going on in Liberia, where they lived was right in the heart of the worst area of the battles between terrorists and between the government forces. And they were taking over houses and Things were being looted and people killed, women raped. He had young children. For two weeks, for two weeks they were locked up in their house and the only water they had was drinking water that came out of their water bed. They drained their water bed to stay alive. But in all of it, and, and bullets were flying at one point, with them and some of the saints, there was no food. And they prayed and said, God, we got to have some food. And they testified how a huge bird, none of them had ever seen a bird like it before. But this huge bird flew in through the window and they caught it and killed it. And they had food. <laughs> I reckon if God can send the ravens, He can send them a bird. Amen. Oh, hallelujah for people that have a walk with God. Amen. Amen. That's why He didn't have to be afraid because He dwells in the secret place the most high. He abides under the shadow of the Almighty. I'll say to the Lord, He's my refuge, my fortress. He's my God, and Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver thee from the snare and fowler from the north and pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and thy, thy buckler. A man lives like this. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night. Oh, aren't you 
you're afraid of your bowling? No. Nah. Don't you think you better run off to America? No. Or to the air of the flies by day. Verse 6 through 10. Quickly, somebody. Well, if anything that describes Ebola and some of these other things, AIDS and some of this other junk that is going on, it sure does describe them.
my heart breaks for you. <laughs> I absolutely love riding a horse. I love riding a horse. As a boy in the summer fishing or horse riding, when I wasn't working, those were two things I loved so much. Still love both of them. Amen. But a horse, you use reins to guide it. Now, when you first are breaking a horse, I've seen some guys, they've got a horse that's real unruly and they've never trained the horse. And they'll have to pull on the, on the if they want the horse to turn this way, they got to turn and jerk and saw on the, the, the bit is in the horse's mouth, so it's pulling in his mouth back on that side and it hurts. I've seen some guys ride a horse in the mouth and the horse is all bloody. Mm. Oh, I hate when I see that. Makes me want to smack that guy. I think, man, you don't know nothing. You need to learn how to train that horse. Or some horses won't listen. They want to rebel all the time anyway. Some of them just got a bad attitude like them. <laughs> but I've seen where they jerk and pull and pull on that ring to get the horse to turn and the horse is right that bit. And they don't want to go that way. And then they want it to go this way. They got to pull and pull and pull. And I've seen sometimes where the horse will get mad at that and get to clamp their teeth down on that bit. And you know, tight to where the person can't break the bit free. And then the horse does what it wants. <laughs> I, was, I got a pony that was just... Had, had hardly been ridden. And I, when I was just a boy, and I began to work with him, and I trained him to where I never had to pull on the, the reins one way or another. If I wanted him to go that way, I'd just lay the reins over against his neck. I'd ride like this. I'd just lay, move my hand and lay so he felt the gentle pressure of that rein on his neck. he would turn and go that way. I could just lay it, move the reins this way so there was a gentle pressure of the reins on his neck on this side. He'd turn and go that way. He'd turn all the time. We'd be running at a dead run, and I just, he just lay over from my leg on the inside and on to my foot, the turf. Sometimes I'd have to move it back because it was going to run. And a dead run, he'd lay over and run. And, oh, I love that. I worked with him. He knew I loved him. I didn't have to kick him or beat him or jerk him around to make him do stuff. He wanted to do what I wanted him to do. I want to be that way with the Lord. I don't want him to have to jerk and pull him to get me to go that way. But what is it that's got the reins in my life? What's sitting in the saddle? Is it the flesh? Flesh says, let's go this way. Oh, okay. Let's go this way. Oh, okay. Let's do this. Oh, okay. The Bible says if you're led around and the flesh is what's running your life, you're headed for destruction. You're headed for death. And eventually you'll be lost and go to hell. But it says, as many as are led by the Spirit of God. It's the Spirit of God that's directing their life. It's the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God says, you need to go over here. The Spirit of God says, you need to go over here. The Spirit of God says, you need to do this. The Spirit of God says, go see this person. It says, call this person. You need to pray for this person. If we're led by the Spirit of the Lord, the Bible says that then we become a real child of God. Literally, it's saying that's who God's real children are. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And literally, it actually means as many as are led by the Spirit of God, that's who God's real children are. Is it the Spirit of God that leads us or is it our flesh we follow? If it's our flesh, we're headed for destruction. Guaranteed. The Japanese says it. It says, "Niku ni shinatte ikiru nara, anata ga wa shinu hoku wa nai kara de aru." That means there is no other possibility. That's what it means in English too. That's what it means in Greek. There's absolutely no other possibility. You will go to destruction. You will be destroyed. You will die. 
Your existence will not be an existence of living. It will be an existence of dying. An existence of death. Many people in this world are running after things they think are going to give them life. But all it does is kill something inside of them more and more and more. It kills their relationship. It kills their dreams. It kills their future. It kills their hope. More and more and more. Something inside of them. Dies. But I'll tell you what. The Lord is life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Yes, sir. If you want to find life, you can find it in Jesus. Amen. 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 Praise God. That's the only place you're going to find it. If you are apart from Him, you're not going to find life, friend. There's no life without Him. You might have an existence, but you'll just be among the walking dead. But if you walk with Him, you're going to find life. Let's stand together. Back to that next week. I thought when we started this, we just go through all these one Sunday real quick. But this is the heart of the whole thing. It's having a walk with God, a relationship with God. Amen. Amen. In Jesus' name, let's take a verse. Amen.